glad to be here uh, to celebrate the Texas National with all of you. And what I wanted to do briefly this evening uh, is talk about the Texas National and uh, in, in a way the broader phenomenon of a, of a university like Stephen Austin and put them in a, a kind of deeper context, the historical context, and then talk about some of what I see as the dangers that are facing uh, events and institutions like this today. Because something like the Texas National is really something to celebrate. It's, uh, it's a, a jury show that reaches out across the country, that brings stuff from all places, parts of the country, um, and all kinds of people to this, to, to Nacogdoches. Um, and I think it's very important for us to understand that events like this, um, this sub union of art, of a serious appreciation and involvement of art, and democratic society, this broad uh, society and culture we live in, the union of art with democratic society uh, in this way is not a thing that's always been. Um, and I, I really associate um, the, the kind of thing we're seeing here and the kind of phenomenon you have. I just spent, uh, as John said, some time uh, over in the art department at the university. And again, um, this phenomenon of people, kids, adult, young adults, whatever, from all kind of backgrounds, um, all kinds of families, all kinds of socioeconomic situations coming to a place where they're studying uh, the possibilities of art. This, again, is not something that's always existed. Um, and these are g great things uh, that so many people can engage with art, both as practitioners and as museum goers, gallery goers, appreciators. But these are things that really I would date um, this kind of phenomenon, you have to date it to the beginning sometime in the 19th century. And it is very much associated with a big phenomenon in the 19th century, which was the growth of literacy, okay? Up until some point in the 19th century, you can make that point wherever you want, earlier, middle, whatever, um, there were all kinds of um, cultural, artistic, philosophic experience that were available to a very small part of a population, okay? And there was this idea that develops in the 19th century, um, and in England people like John Ruskin and William Morris talk about it, that with the growth of literacy, with the rise of the middle class, um, and the possibility for people uh, in the lower class to rise into the middle class, the pro possibility of universal education, there's suddenly this idea that more and more people can have access to all these things, okay? And we, you know, we come to a point, I think, where uh, in the mid 20th century, um, or the later 20th century, I think people in America sort of took this uh, for granted, which may be why um, there has been in the last couple of decades this squeezing of money for education. And we've seen just in the last month this very interesting uprising of teachers um, across the country saying, look, we have to have be paid decently. There has to be more money in the schools for education. I think a lot of you are aware of the fact that art and music programs have actually been shrinking in many places in America in the last few decades. Um, so although some of us who are older kind of grew up thinking all, taking all of this for granted, um, it, it, it's not a permanent thing, uh, this union of art, culture, and democratic society. And there's an idea behind it, which in the 19th century was a revolutionary idea. This was that any person, wherever they were born, uh, you know, uh, you know, in a you know in a in a work, mining town with a father working in a mine, um, or if they were born in a chateau, they any child had the wherewithal, the sort of natural ability with education with help to have access to all kinds of things, to great poetry, to the classics of literature, to classical music, to Mozart's uh, 
string quartets to the paintings of Raphael or uh, the sculpture of Michelangelo. And this is an idea that begins in the 19th century. Uh, and it is an idea about the possibilities that are inherent in anybody if a society will uh, kind of unleash them. Okay. And, and when you really think from the 19th, I mean, it's not a steady progress and there are, there are problems always along the way. But from sometime in the mid-19th century, I think to sometime in the mid-20th or late 20th century, there was really this sense of ever-expanding uh, promise for people to have access to the arts and to engage with the arts. Um, and you know, there were certain art forms that almost grew out of this phenomenon. For instance, the novel, the novels of Dickens or um, Victor Hugo in France, which, which were a form that was really um, uh, designed uh, to, to bring uh, great literary complexity and subtlety to a very broad population. Opera in, in music is really the case here, where certain operas, certain composers became enormously um, uh, popular among a wide audience. But the thing that then began to happen in the, around the turn into the 20th century and into the 20th century was that it began to seem that things that had initially um, been created for a very small audience, the writings of James Joyce or, or Virginia Woolf or ab the abstract paintings of Mondrian or Kandinsky, things where the artists themselves, the creators themselves, thought they only had a very limited possibility. Of There's probably a couple of chairs up, still up here in the front if anybody wants to sit down. Um, th there came this phenomenon at the beginning of the 20th century and into the middle of the 20th century when even these things that seemed potentially uh, available to a small group of people who had, um, you know, the kind of willingness to deal with um, painting that didn't deal with reality, had the willingness to deal with a thorny kind of literary text like Joyce's Ulysses. It, it came to be that education was so broad and at such a level that all kinds of people were finding their way to these things in museums, in literature classes. Um, and you had phenomenon like, um, I mean, the great example in New York City is the Museum of Modern Art, which is founded in 1929. Um, now, at, po at that point in 1929, there, there basically is not a museum in America that owns an abstract painting, okay? Abstract art is already about 15 years old. Um, and Alfred Barr, Alfred H. Barr Jr., uh, who's a young man, with the help of the financial backing of a, of a a, a trio, basically, of wealthy New York women, um, starts this museum with the idea of making modern art and then, within a decade or two, contemporary modern art um, accessible to an ever-growing population. And, and, it's, and, and it's interesting how Barr does this um, because he's both a very kind of erudite scholar but he's also a showman, okay? Um, and he knows how to, how to kind of uh, create a hoopla around his, his shows and his museum. Um, uh, but his idea is if he can uh, create like fun events for kids, if he can um, do something that's somewhat sensational, like at one point they did a big show in. Uh, uh, in, the, the, in 1936 called Cubism and Abstract Art, and some of the abstract sculpture that came into America, there were problems at customs. The customs people were saying you have to pay duty on this because we don't rec recognize it as art. And he got a lot of publicity around this thing that the customs people don't understand that this is art as a way of getting people's attention. So he was kind of a showman, but at the same time, when people came into the museum, he was, he basically, then the sort of the showmanship circus part stopped. And what he was saying is, I want you to look really, really seriously at these works. And that's, I want you to step up to the plate and really, really think about what you're seeing. And he wrote um, 
I, I have these terrible allergies, so I'm going to sniffle from time to time. It's, uh, it's not my coke ha habit acting up. Um, <laughs> I sometimes feel when I do this in public, it's like, oh, there he goes again. Um, uh, but Barr was kind of doing this, th this, this two-sided operation where he knew he had to have some glamour and some glitz to get people in the door. But once they were in the door, he was very serious, and he wrote a series of books. Um, he, he wrote a, a book which went through endless editions about how to look at modern painting, really explaining to people the kind of basics of formal analysis and how to think about a work of art in that way. Um, I, some of you have probably read Ralph Ellison, uh, the, who wrote um, The Invisible Man, a great novel. Ralph Ellison, uh, who grew up black in the South, um, published in the 1950s, I believe, I believe it is, an extraordinary essay called The Little Man at Chihaw Station. Um, and it was really about this, this um, phenomenon, which Barr believed in so passionately, of in a democratic society, in a society where we believe that everybody has an equal right and an equal access, potentially, to kind of the loftiest human experiences, um, in a society like that, how, how do we make this possible? How do we make that possible? And Ellison wrote this essay uh, called Little Man at Chiho Station, in which he told about he had um, uh, uh, gone to, uh, I believe it's the Tuskegee Institute, uh, an all-black college in the South. And he was studying music at the time. And he kind of flubbed a piano recital. Um, and his teacher said to him, after she said, um, Ralph, you have to always be prepared. And she said, because. You know Chihaw Station. Chihaw Station was this tiny little railroad station at the end of the line. And his teacher said to him, you know, anywhere in America, even hiding behind the stove in Chihaw Station, there might be somebody who was capable of telling a first-rate piano performance from a second-rate piano performance. And you have to always aim high. And it's a very long essay in which he basically talks about this, this thing that Barr believed in, too, the potential of all people to have access to these things. Now, let me switch to the present. Um, and uh, you know, we know um, how embattled uh, at the moment culture is in this country and education is in this country. Um, and I think a lot of, you know, there, we have tremendous f problems about funding, um, both not just public funding, but frankly, one of the things I really don't understand, and it's a great mystery to me, is why with so much new wealth in America, um, such a small percentage of it seems to go to support um, our museums, our concert halls, our ballet, our dance, uh, companies are uh, opera companies. I mean, you know, New York City for, I don't know, 50, 60 years had two full-time opera companies, one of which the New York City Opera collapsed a couple of years ago for lack of, I don't know, 10 or 20 million dollars, which in the scheme of America today and wealth is nothing, okay? So there's, the, there's those issues of funding and all that. But the other thing that I, I really want to, I want to say a word or two about is this question of how, how do you bring the broadest audience to these extraordinary experiences that we all know one can have, both as a creator of art or as, a, uh, as somebody who goes to museums or reads novels or reads poetry. Um, and I think one of the dangers that we have now, and I go back for a moment to, to Barr. Barr was both a showman, okay, and a kind of erudite scholar. Um, and he saw he, the, the need for both of those. I think today, one of the dangers is that in the cultural world, showmanship is um, outstripping often and kind of overwhelming the serious business of really engaging with a painting or a piece of music um, or a poem. Um, and uh, we're, I think we're, 
we're at a point where we're so worried now that we might exclude somebody that we're afraid to say, well, you know, this isn't all simple. It's not just you go to the museum and you go to the cafe and you, uh, you know, you look on your iPhone uh, at the app and you go to the gift shop and you leave. I mean, um, there is involved in cultural experience, in literary experience, in musical experience, in artistic experience. There, there, there's a, there is a kind of stepping up uh, to the plate that's involved. Um, some things are difficult, okay? Um, there are certain kinds of paintings that are hard to, to understand without looking a lot, without reading a lot. Um, there, are, there are certain kinds of music that are th music that's thorny, okay? Puccini, you get in one way, a late Beethoven string quartet, you've got to access in a different way, and it may take repeated listenings. Um, and I think we're sometimes afraid now um, that we're going to put somebody off by not say by saying, "Oh, well, you know, maybe you need to try f for five more times before you get it." Um, we, we 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 want everything. I mean, this is the danger. This is I think we're we're getting more and more acquainted with the dangers of this vision we have of a of an inclusive. Uh, cultural world, um, and I and I don't say this to be elitist, and it, this is very important because, in a way, the elitist thing is to say, to my mind, what's elitist is to say, oh, uh, you, you'll never get Mondrian, so just yeah, go to the museum and you know, uh, you know, uh, do a selfie in front of the Mondrian and go. You know what I mean? Like you, you, you. you, you you, you, you'll never be able to really understand what he's about and what his ideas were and what his ideals were. That, to me, is the elitist attitude. Um, but I think if we are going to keep culture having a really flourishing place in a broad society, we have to demand um, that it is rigorous sometimes. It is tough sometimes. You've got to be willing to say, um, you know, it, you're not getting it because you haven't listened enough. You don't understand enough about, um, you know, if you, if you, before you reject late Beethoven string quartets, listen to the early ones and, and then start to understand what he's doing as he changes. Um, we need to demand that rigor. And I think there's a kind of fear um, in, our, in the society now that anytime you say, well, this is hard and not everybody's going to get it, um, it's, like you're, it's like you're turning you're you're rejecting uh, society at large, or you're being undemocratic. When in fact, I think the truly democratic thing is to say some of these things are very tough. Um, uh, Emily Dickinson's poetry does demand a lot of thought and a lot of concentration. Um, but at the same time, if you put in the time, there's an experience you're going to get. Um, that's very special. And I think one, one other thing I want, to, I want to say is I think we've, we've, we've come to confuse uh, two different kinds of artistic experience. Um, the one that we call pop culture and the other that, for lack of a better term, we tend to call high culture. Um, and I say this as, I mean, I was uh, born in 1951. I, was, I went to high school in the Bay Area and went to you know, Grateful Dead concerts in San Francisco before I knew how to drive with friends driving the car. They didn't drive that well. I thought I was going to die <laughs> on the Bayshore Freeway. But, um, but th there's a very important distinction I think that needs to be made between these different kinds of artistic experience. For me, the thrill of um, pop culture, whether um, it's a great band or a great pop singer, uh, uh, or a movie that everybody you know is, is seeing, or TV now is giving us so many of these experiences. One of the thrills of pop culture is that you experience it um, like with everybody else. Um, you know, when everybody was watching The Sopranos, everybody was watching The Sopranos, and everybody was talking about it. Um, uh, you know, w when I was in college, you know, there would be like a Beatles song that was on the jukebox in every single place you went, and everybody was into it. Um, 
And that is a, mo a certain model of cultural experience, which is, and I think it's wonderful because um, you know, we all experience those things together. But I think there's a danger, which is when we apply that model too much to uh, other kinds of cultural experience. Because one of the things that's wonderful about a poem uh, or certain kinds of novels or certain kinds of paintings, um, certain kinds of music is that you engage with it more individually. Um, and it becomes an engagement between you and this work and in some way with the artist in a very personal way. Um, and I think we t sometimes there's a danger of downgrading those kind of experiences or not understanding them. Um, and you know the whole obsession with quantification now, um, with big data, works into this because um, you know it's like everything is how many copies were sold, you know how many people saw it. Um, but the fact is there are a lot of kinds of um, artistic experience that accrues in a slower way, and we need to find a place for that. So I, I just to, to conclude, I think. Um, you know, within this, this kind of really large, um, expansive vision that we have of, of cultural experience, we, we need to, to preserve space for the difficult, um, for the thing that grows slowly, that um, is important to some people but not other people. Um, I think we really need to fight to preserve uh, the space for that uh, in, right now. Thank you very much. I'd be happy to. If, can we take a few questions or? Few, yeah. um, so I, I loved your your talking initially about creating more access. Right. And, and that's fantastic because I think that's what we right. all want. But I think then we're confusing that, if I'm hearing you, to make the product more accessible. Well, I think that I think this is the paradox. Yeah. I mean, I think it's, and I mean, you know, I, I don't know if people have them anymore, but you know, when I was a kid, and sort of my parents' generation, people talked about the the high school teacher who was murder on you, who gave you you'd been an A student, you got C's on on writing assignments, you were never good enough, and you were infuriated and everything, and then you realized five years later that this person was tell you know was actually calling you to a higher standard. I mean, I th but I, yes, I think there is a real uh, need to be expansive, but very rigorous at, at the same uh, time. And to, um, to expect a lot of people. I mean, the Getty uh, in LA, which uh, I don't know if they're doing anymore, but they have been involved in education programs around the country. And one of the things they were doing uh, really all across the country was a program, I think it was for elementary school kids, where they were given access to photographs by really great photographers like Cartier Bresson and Walker Evans. And these kids, were, were they looked at these things and they talked about them. And then they were given cheap cameras and sent out to photograph. And so that kind of idea of being broad, but also bringing um, you know, the best, um, that I think is, is the goal. Um, um, but, but, you know, the danger today is, you know, uh, some parent goes and complains to the principal and say, oh, well, you know, you're not, you're being unfair to, you know, it's like you said it wasn't good enough. And of course that's, well, you know, I, you know uh, well, that's uh, a word we don't, you know, we're not supposed to put value on things or something. How can we engage people with culture without putting value? But at the same time, and, and there is then this accusation, well, you're being elitist, um, but I mean, I sometimes call myself an elitist populist, you know, <laughs> which I, I. Any other questions, comments? Yeah. I am also concerned with um, who is allowed then to, dis to um, determine the value of our cultural products. And so, you know, it's. It's, it's great to be, I love elitism and, and valuing things for being great, but, but, it, but who gets to be able to define those things? And does that include our minority populations, our, our historically underrepresented groups of people? 
you know, are they are they brought into the fold in terms of this elitist, you know, judgment making? Is that part of it? Well, I think there are a number there are a number of questions in your question. Um, one is this is a country we are a uh, you know we are a, a quilt, um, and there are many different cultures, many different high cultures, in fact, within this culture. I mean, you know, Hispanic culture in the in uh, on the Western Hemisphere. I mean, you go to Mexico. I mean, the sophistication of Hispanic culture. Uh, is staggering, okay? I mean, going back thousands, thousands of years, okay? Um, and I think one issue uh, that people are very aware of in America now is that in North America, although interestingly enough at the Museum of Modern Art in the 1940s, there were efforts made to really tap into Hispanic culture. Uh, I think people in many museums and many places have been realizing in the last decade that Hispanic culture, as which has its own traditions, and conventions and achievements has not been enough recognized. They, likewise, Native American culture. Okay, um, I think one. Of, but 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 there are also there are other there are traditions. For instance, ballet. Okay, ballet is a a tradition. Okay, um, that begins in Europe. The the French and the Russians are always arguing, and the Italians about who it really starts with. Okay. But it has its own traditions and conventions and standards, um, uh, just as other traditions do. Um, and I think you misunderstand when when a, a, when different people go and uh, audition for a ballet company, okay. Um, and somebody says, well, "Well, I'm sorry, you don't have the physique for it," or uh, you're. You know, nature has not given you what you need to do this particular kind of dancing. That, to me, is not. That is a a perfectly uh, just and democratic response. That's saying there are here certain there, there are conventions, traditions, standards within this creative form. Okay, um, and. Uh, it's, that's not the place for you, okay? That to me is not a, 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 a rejection of that person. That is, that is a fact of, that is, grows out of respect for those conventions, okay? Um, uh, so in other words, I think there are two things going on here, okay? One is recognizing a range of traditions, okay? Um, but the other one is recognizing that traditions have standards and conventions. Um, one can disagree about them and argue about them. Um, you can argue about um, who's, uh, you know, uh, uh, the greatest uh, classical ballet dancer. You can argue about um, who who plays trumpet, jazz trumpet better, um, but. I personally don't want to live in a world where there, where, where, where there are no such uh, values that grow out of artistic traditions. Do you understand what I'm saying? Um, and the fact of the matter is, it's not as if any of these traditions are monolithic. Okay, that's the other thing I think that needs to be said. I mean, there's a lot of talk today about gatekeepers, right, being um, these sort of malevolent forces. Okay. Um, what a gatekeeper really is, okay, um, is you're not agreeing with me. Probably you're looking away. Um, what what a gatekeeper, or you're uncomfortable with what I'm saying. To me, what a gatekeeper ideally is is a person who is passionate about something, very passionate about it, and out of their passion, um, makes judgments. Um, I mean, I I don't think there's anything wrong with making judgments if they come out of a passion for that artistic form of expression or that tradition. Um, now, you know, we don't live in a, in, a, in a perfect world, we live in an imperfect world, but there are gatekeepers and gatekeepers. And one of the things also, I mean, modernism 
uh, in all the arts is the revolt against gatekeepers by people who went off and became, in some sense, their own gatekeepers um, and started new sets of standards in opposition to old sets of standards. I frankly think we do our pop, the, the democratic public, a disfavor if we deny them the wonder and glory of standards, frankly. Um, I think we're doing people a terrible disfavor if we tell them, oh, well, every, everybody, everything's all the same. Um, I don't think that does anybody a favor. Yeah. Well, I'm, I'm kind of curious about your final statement about, uh, you know, we have to preserve and we have to promote things that are hard to deal with and maybe aren't you know, broadly accepted. Um, and I, I, you know, I'm a printmaker and I, I tune into that a lot because it's a very obscure practice, and there are, among many in art, there are lots of obscure practices. You mentioned that New York Opera is no longer there, you know. And I think a lot about cross-checking that against what, what are the trends in society, and it feels to me like society is driven by meme-based culture, and, uh, you know, sound bites and things like that that are just so easily digestible and viral, and then they're gone, you know. And so I guess my question is, how do you think, um, how do you think we promote, you say people who are gatekeepers are going to be passionate about things like this, but, you know, how do you promote the things that are slower and, and harder to access and... and um... I, well, I think there is, there remains a yearning for the slower and harder to access. I mean, it's funny, you know, around the time of the recession, um, and when the time, and that was around the time when e-books really began to t take off, there was a feeling in the publishing world in New York, which I know fairly well, that um, print books were dead, were completely dead. And, and there was a whole panic, and companies, big publishing houses, let, let off a lot of faculty, uh, a lot of staff. Um, and then it turned out that print, that e-books leveled off, and print books weren't as dead as people thought. Um, you're a printmaker. I think printmaking is always going to be a kind of dissident, at the margins activity. I think the the answers are passion, determination, finding your community, and making it happen. Um, and uh, you know, I mean, in the Middle Ages, I mean, I hope we're not going back into the Dark Ages, but I mean, <laughs> the Dark Ages when um, uh, you know most knowledge of Greek and Latin literature had been lost. Um, people in monasteries <coughs> held the line and preserved all kinds of things. I mean, I, to me, there is a fever for culture, for beauty, for excellence of all kinds. It just, uh, to me, it's a fundamental human thing, okay? And I don't think it goes away. It may, I do think it's possible that some of these things may be more marginalized in the next 50 years than they have been in the past 50 years. Um, I, I don't know. But I think, um, you know, I mean, I met with a bunch of you know, young people who are passionate about these things today. Um, uh, I think uh, it, it can be done. Um, it, you have to be very passionate, and you have to not be discouraged. Um, and, and you have to, you know, in creative fields, you have to kind of be open to, you know, you don't always know where the next door is going to open, and you have to be ready when it opens and go through it. I like when you just talked about Beethoven. You kept going back to Beethoven being a rep because he was a revolutionist with the way he wrote his music. Right. And he did that. Right. Even like even in the art world, it was always that person that was pushing that boundary. Right. When it's, you know, when you were talking yeah. about abstract art. Yeah, I mean, and I, I, and pushing the, I mean, we sometimes forget now how you know James Joyce's Ulysses was privately printed. Okay. Um, you know, by a rich person. I mean, you know, it's hard to, to imagine that now. Emily Dickinson had, what, one and a half poems published during her lifetime? I mean, it's hard. Walt Whitman was panned. Um, you know, Leaves of Grass was panned when it first came out, and basically had, he had to privately print it. I mean, Melville's Moby Dick was hated, um, you know, and barely read, barely bought when, it, when he published it. Um, he was heartbroken. I mean, you know, in some way we think of these, oh, those are those romantic stories, they're not true. But they actually are true. They actually are true. Now, there are artists, great artists, who were immensely popular in their time, Michelangelo, Raphael, that's true too. But um, there is no uh, reliable relationship between certainly near, 
time popularity and excellence. And there are lots of very popular authors and artists who, 50 years later, people say, oh, no, no, nobody really liked that, did they? You know? So I think, I mean, if you're in the arts, you have to take the long, the long view. Yeah. Uh, how does this translate into more funding? Because you said funding's flat for art and things, but at the same time you're saying we need more standards. So how does that translate into more funding? Well, I'm very, I mean, the funding thing really is, is an enigma to me. I mean, my position, you know, I know, I have friends to the left of me who feel, who are very, always skeptical of, of private funding or corporate funding, who believe that all arts funding should be government funding. My feeling is we need all the money we can get. Um, we all know that 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 state and federal arts funding has been, you know, cut and has become a kind of uh, political uh, football, which it was not. I mean, it was not. You know, for a long time, uh, you know, Re Republican and Democratic administrations in Washington were agreed on the importance of arts and and also cultural. You know, um, the, the National Endowment for the Humanities. Um, Private, f corporate funding has gone down. I think corporate, corporations, well, this is interesting. I mean, I think corporations in the mid to late 20th century really felt, um, I don't know, maybe some of them were doing better, but I think there was also a sense that it was part of the grandeur of America. Um, and I don't know that they feel, you know, uh, play, you know, places like Chase Manhattan Bank and IBM used to be great patrons of art. Um, and that's not so much true. Um, I, why? Um, the new wealth is not engaging with the arts as much is a conundrum to me, and I have to say an extremely disturbing thing to me. Um, one of the things I've heard said is, um, for instance, in the San Francisco Bay Area, where they have, you know, have full-time opera, symphony, ballet, there's been a lot of talk that the, old, the kind of support that old San Francisco money gave to those things, the new Silicon Valley money is not giving to. And some people have said to me that they thought one of the problems is that money, old money tended to be more, see more of a regional vision. In other words, if the family was in the Bay Area, we give to Bay Area things. Now, you know, everybody's, you know, we're all global, you know, one kid lives in New York, one kid lives in Texas, one kid lives in Florida, mom and dad are in, you know, Seattle. And there was a feeling that maybe there isn't that sense of loyalty to local, to museums and so on. But I don't know. I mean, I find it very, very upsetting, frankly. And it goes back to the question over here that do, do, do these, these experts in, uh, you know, digital everything, do they not really value um, these other kinds of experiences enough? I don't know. It's... Uh, I, I think it's a worrisome thing, and uh, uh, I, uh, something that I hope will, I hope there'll be a turn for the better in that kind of support, because we do need more support. And it's also, you know, you look back at a lot of the great funding of the arts in the late 19th and early 20th century, um, it doesn't take that much money to fund a magazine, you know, a little magazine, um, you know, a gallery, uh, you know, $500,000, a million dollars, which is peanuts, right? I mean, probably not for most of us in this room, but, but for a lot of the money in America today, that's like nothing. And for those amounts of money, you can do incredible cultural work. And I don't know why more of it isn't happening, to be perfectly honest. I think it's because it's the me generation. Because people I know who are in the Silicon Valley industries, they, I mean, I can, you have so much money. Why don't you buy my art? Yeah. You're like my best friend. Why don't you buy my art? <laughs> <laughs> and they don't because they're just not interested in art. They're interested in their toys. They're interested in what their technology can do. But then they're and and then they're right. I mean, they're very creative people because they came up with these ideas. I mean, these really important ideas that are running our world. But they're not interested well, in Well, one of the things, I mean, I think that maybe goes to what you're saying and to this whole question is, I, one of the points that was made in the late 19th and 20th century about art, and I mean art in the broad sense of music, literature, was that for many people it took the place of spirituality and religion. And, and I think, I mean, one of the things, you know, Alfred Barr, um, people often point out about this great founding director of the Museum of Modern Art that his 
his father and a lot of the men in his fa extended family had been um, uh, ministers, Protestant ministers. And, and people have said that Barr was a kind of minister preaching uh, the gospel of art. And I think there is a sense in which for, for a certain generation, some of the, the, the search for the, for the other, for the transcendent, for the more than material that used to go into religion shifted into art. So you have people supporting poets, supporting painters, supporting those kinds of things. And, I, and in some ways, we may be in a, le, in, a, in a less spiritual age. I mean, there are certain kinds of, of spirituality, but I, I don't know. I mean, I think, I think there are... Um, you know, the problem is just saying to these people, look, you're, you're too me, 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 you should give me money. That's unfortunately not the way to persuade them. I don't, I don't. Look, I think the other thing may be that um, uh, people need, um, some of these people may not have grown up with intense experiences of art in, uh, in school. I'll, I, I'll, cl I'll close with just one uh, amazing story. I, 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 as you were told, I've been working on this huge biography of Alexander Calder. Um, and volume one, which goes to 1940 when he's 42, is out. And volume two, which will go to his death in 1976, is coming out in a couple of years. And, night, and the second volume is actually going to begin with a prologue, which takes you to 1969. In 1969, Grand Rapids, Michigan, okay, um, with the backing of Gerald Ford, who was then a very important member of Congress, was the first city to take federal money to do a monumental piece of, of art which was a huge Calder sculpture. It was actually the first really big Calder in America, okay, in Grand Rapids, Michigan, okay. And there was a lot of blowback for a while in Grand Rapids. Calder lived in France. He was an anti-war activist, very much against the war in Vietnam and so on. And there was, there was all kinds of stuff in the paper. He's not really American, which was not true. He's, you know, he's a communist, et cetera. But this thing went up, and it's become kind of the core of the revival of downtown Grand Rapids. How did this happen? A fabulous woman who I've now become very good friends with, who's in her early 80s, named Nancy Twiddell. Nancy, in elementary school in the Midwest, had been shown a movie in her elementary school class about Calder that had actually been produced by the Museum of Modern Art. And she never forgot this. She, go, she ends up in Grand Rapids, married to a guy who's, this, who's a kind of Grand Rapids gentry. Okay, and she gets kind of involved in local things. And she is the one who ma really made the, when somebody came and said, well, you know, there is this problem. Uh, uh, Henry Gelser, curator from New York, came, said, well, you know, maybe you can get money. She knew Gerald Ford. He was a family friend. And she went to him, and this thing whole happened. And she became very good friends with Calder. But this is because of what she saw in elementary school, because a teacher showed them Calder. So, I mean, there you have it. And now in Grand Rapids, Michigan, is this Calder masterpiece. Um, so I think part of the thing, again, is people have to be, they have to have the taste for it um, from early on. Thank you. So, Thank you. Uh,